Before you begin to listen to this video, I just wanted to add this. As this video may become a little bit confusing because it kind of does jump around. As I was telling the story and putting it together, I would find articles that I had overlooked and I would add those. So basically what I'm going to do right now is just give kind of a brief, put together a little brief um, outline of this story. Eric Smith was a mine foreman from Tazewell County, Virginia. He had gone to Atlanta, Georgia with a group of workmates on a work seminar, a work training, and he returned home, and that was the last time anyone from his job ever saw him. No one, there was no real indication whether anyone outside of his wife had actually spoken to him in the week leading up to him being reported missing. He was, if you, as you'll hear in this story, he was very dedicated to his job. He was very professional at his job. He was not known to miss work as he was the superintendent, and then he was in charge of all the other men. So it wasn't like him to just not call in or have a really good excuse to miss work. He himself, it was reported, had never called the mines to let them know that he could not come in to work. Uh, from what I was able to gather, they received one phone call from his wife in the first couple of days after they returned back from Georgia, and she told them that he was not feeling well, that he thought maybe he was coming down with the flu, and that he was not going to be coming in to work. Now, he did not work for the next six days. On the um, November the 9th, November the 8th or the 9th, he... Um, it was reported by his wife that he started to feel a little bit better and decided that he was going to go out into the woods to hunt, to deer hunt. And he had a tree stand about a mile from his home, so he said that he was just going to go out there and spend a little bit of time. He wasn't going to hunt very long and that he would be back that afternoon. According to her, because this is, a, this is the only person that reported having spoken to him, I don't know if anyone in his family or anyone in his any of his neighbors reported seeing him or speaking to him in the days from the time his friend dropped him off after they returned from the airport from this trip and the day that he was reported missing. So only his wife is the one given this story. She left that day to go to her mother's in Buchanan County, Virginia, which is probably about an hour away. She took one of their daughters to help her mother decorate for Christmas. This is the story that she told. When she returned home that evening, he had not come home. She started to get concerned about him, and she went down to the local church where her in-laws were attending church and asked if he had called, if he had come by their home, if they had seen or spoken to him that day. So, of course, everyone became concerned, and they went out to look for him. Now, as time went on and they began to search for him, no traces of him were ever seen. No, they could not find his weapon, his his um, muzzle loader that he had taken with him. His truck was there with his wallet and his cell phone and his cigarettes were left behind at home, which everyone would, that knew him said he wouldn't have gone into the woods without his cell phone or his cigarettes. So everyone kind of questioned that, but... She had reported that he had been feeling a little under the weather, that he thought he might have had pneumonia that week, so he had not worked, and maybe they explained it away that he hadn't been smoking because he was feeling sick. As time went on and people started to ask questions, it was reported that he had not called the mines that whole week. No one from the workplace had heard from him, except for a couple of emails that they had received throughout the week saying, that he was, he thought maybe he had pneumonia. He, you know, I couldn't find any record of the emails, but just what was told. And the day before, he had sent an email to someone saying that he was feeling somewhat better and that he was thinking that he was probably going to return to work that coming Saturday. And then Friday was the day I believe that he went into the woods, or it was reported that he went into the woods. And this is where the story picks up. The search for him began. No trace of him was ever found. 
Uh, you'll hear also in this story about search dogs that could not pick up his scent in the woods. So it was all very suspicious. And then eventually the police decided that this was not a missing person case. And they deemed this a homicide. And ten years have passed and there have been no arrests that I know of. And no person of interest has been publicly named. So I just wanted to kind of give that little brief outline because, like I said, the story does kind of jump around a little bit. So this is the story of Eric Grady Smith, and I hope you enjoy. The following story is the first part in a multi-part series of cold cases across southwest Virginia. Tazewell County, Virginia is located in the southwestern part of the state. Located nearby are Cedar Bluff, Richlands, and a few other small towns that um, run along US 460. In the area of Cedar Bluff, there is a community, a place called West Hurt Buggy Road. On November the 9th, 2013, 41-year-old coal miner Eric Smith left his home, according to his wife, to go hunting. He's never been seen since. In the initial searches for Eric, it was considered a missing person, but now it is being investigated as a homicide. And this is dated 2022, Cedar Bluff, Virginia. At first, Haswell County investigators believed that a local man was just missing, but now they believe he, is, he has been murdered. Eric Smith, age 41, a coal miner, left his home on November the 8th, 2013. So it's been exactly 10 years ago since he went missing. He went to go hunting along West Hurt Buggy Road. He took his, um, he reportedly took his rifle, but he left behind his cell phone and cigarettes inside the house and left his wallet in his truck. Maybe he wouldn't have brought his cell phone. Maybe he didn't want it accidentally going off during the hunt and, you know, but he may have left it in his truck with his wallet because accidents can happen in the woods and maybe he would have wanted his cell phone nearby. Smith's mother, Dreama Smith, told the Telegraph that her son's disappearance is a complete mystery. Smith told his wife he was going to the top of the ridge to hunt and that he would be back. Dreamer Smith added that his wife then drove to Buckhannon County with one of her daughters to decorate a Christmas tree for her mother. When he was at home after she returned and it began to get dark out that evening, she began to get worried. What followed was a 911 call and a massive search. Local people, law enforcement, rescue squads, and canine units went out to search for Eric. The search and rescue team and the mining company where Eric Smith worked named Buchanan One also sent out their men to help hunt. The whole community came out and it was wonderful to see everyone out searching for Eric, but they, it turned up nothing. Every inch of the woods was combed. It was like he vanished into thin air. Eric's mother says that it has been perplexing that he did not take his cell phone with him. He would never have left his cell phone behind, she said. He was a mine superintendent, and he was on call 24-7. Dreama Smith said there was no indication of any problems. He was a happy family man. He loved his job. And the strangest part about it all is that not even his rifle was found. He may have vanished, but did his rifle also vanish? It's been talked about over the years, and people, some people have suggested and believe that in the uh, 
scramble maybe to hide evidence that whoever killed him disposed of the the rifle which could possibly have been the murder weapon and left his wallet in his truck but the cell phone and the cigarettes which were left at home were just overlooked um this leads people to believe that he was killed inside the home and was never had never gone hunting um, it also could be that he did go hunting and encountered someone else and they may have killed him and taken his rifle. But if that was the case, then where's his body? Um, these are just some different theories that people have. An article on Reddit says that the wilderness there is vast and in a way you really need to see see it in person to appreciate it. Um, that is true. It is very, um, it's a very wooded area. It's surrounded by forest. It's close to the Jefferson National Forest. And, but the area described where Eric Smith lived was not what you would consider to be an isolated area. He was very close to US 460. He was uh, about a mile from Cedar Bluff. He was uh, about three or four miles from a, a mall. So he wasn't way back out in the woods, but they did say that the area that they searched was around four to 800 acres was covered over the period of time that they searched for him. It's very possible that his body could have been overlooked, but I don't think very many people really believe that because of the fact that his tree stand was only a mile from where he from his home. Unless he saw a a deer and just went after it, but he would as a seasoned hunter, as an experienced and skilled hunter, he wouldn't have gone very far. And had he killed a deer, he would have headed right straight back to his truck. This is one reason why most people don't believe that he was out there hunting at all because he definitely would have taken his cell phone with him. If he had had pneumonia, as his wife had told everyone, he probably would have been too weak, really, to even attempt to... Um, he, he may have just wanted to get out of the house and get some fresh air and try to, to get to feeling better. Why didn't he call his co-workers or his, his, you know, his job and say, feeling a little bit better, I'm going to try to head in to work on Saturday. This is what he reportedly told them in an email, that he was starting to feel a little bit better and hoped to be back to work by Saturday. It's my personal belief that his wife knew that in as time went on, she was not going to be able to continue to use the I'm too sick to work excuse. She knew that as the foreman, that somebody was going to come questioning, where's he at? Why is he not coming in to work? And she knew she had to do something. So I believe the emails were sent in an attempt to kind of keep them at arm's length for a few more days to give her time to dispose of his body. She had to have had help, I believe. He was six foot one and 210 pounds. I don't know what her description is because I haven't seen anything about her. I know there's people out there that live in the area that knew her, knew what size woman she was, but I doubt very much that she would have been able to carry a man of that height and weight, a dead body, a dead weight, on her own. So this is just my own, you know, opinions out here. And a lot of people are saying they believe that he had a, an accident and slipped and fell. Well, you know what? They would have found his body. They would have eventually found his body. And as it's been 10 years, and I would say that there's still people going out there searching for him. I would say that there are people who go out into those woods to hunt ginseng. They go turkey hunting. They go deer hunting. Maybe they go looking for dry land fish or mushrooms as people might know them 
I would say that there are people that go out into that area, and whether they go out there deliberately looking for Eric Smith or whether they just happen to be in the area looking for, uh, you know, turkey hunting or whatever other hunting they might be doing, they would have come upon some of his remains. Had he laid there and died over time, animal activity, animals would have removed his bones, and something would have been found of him, his clothing, his gun. I don't believe Eric Smith ever stepped foot out into those woods that day. And I'll stand by that, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Eric Smith's co-workers at the console mine where he worked have spoken highly of him and his work ethic. They said he was a man of high character. And um, Don Hilton of Bluefield, Virginia, who worked with him described him as a very responsible person. He was dedicated to his family and his job. He was a mine foreman on the day shift, and he was responsible for making sure the mine was operating in accordance with state and federal regulations. If there was a violation or something not done properly, he was the person that the inspectors would come to talk to. It was a position with a lot of responsibility and he had to understand the mining laws in and out. It was disturbing seeing someone you work with every day just disappear like that. This was not a man who would have just up and left behind his family and his job and his responsibilities. He was a good coal miner and he was production oriented and he was a fine mine foreman. Former co-workers and friends of Eric Smith who disappeared in 2013 talk about their friend and describe him as a man who would never leave his family behind or his career. And it's got their names here. Um, I'm not going to go through all the names. It's just men that he'd worked with. Retired coal miners gathered at a local restaurant in Bluefield and shared their thoughts about a missing co-worker they admired and respected and how they cannot believe he would just simply walk away from his life. 41-year-old Eric Smith of Cedar Bluff, Virginia, went missing on his own land after he set off to go hunting on the morning of November the 9th, 2013. Law enforcement agencies, friends, and families all conducted an extensive search. Investigators have told the family that sometimes missing people simply leave but the family does not accept this theory and neither do his co-workers and neither do I and I've talked about that in some of my other stories that I've covered where the police will say that maybe he just walked away um, I don't think so I don't think this was the kind of man who had a reason to walk away not from his job not from his career not from his pension and his insurance and everything else that his job offered him if he was having trouble in his marriage um, maybe he would have worked that out or maybe he would have left that marriage but that doesn't mean he's just going to simply leave behind his entire existence especially not his young children it just says here some of the men talking about him said he was always the first one to arrive in the morning and usually the last one to leave Another man said, we worked together for many years. I remember when he was hourly, and then he ended up becoming my boss. I knew him for 14 years, and he was always dedicated to his job, and uh, he was like a member of the family. He was always about safety, they said. Many of his co-workers were unaware that he had lost a that he was blinded in one eye after an accident with a bit machine. He was walking past the machine about 20 feet when the accident occurred and he got a piece of fragment in his eye. You couldn't tell it by looking at him. He talked in a safety meeting about how he lost his eye, his sight in his eye, and how important it was for guys to wear the protective gear. Um, and it just goes on to talk more about these men re recalling working with him and what kind of a worker he was and how he treated everyone fairly and equally. Um, 
if you had legitimate problems at work, you could always go talk to him. He would always try to work things out fairly. They say that he was also competitive and liked to show off pictures of his turkey and other game that he tracked down. But he was also a devoted family man. They say that he was a, a good temper. He had a good temper. He never held grudges against anybody. Uh, and nobody knew of anyone who had any grudges against him or would want to harm him. No one in this group believes that he would have walked away from his family and his career. He loved his family, and, uh, including his, his siblings. His parents were still in his life. He, he liked to hunt. He liked to be in the woods. He enjoyed his own land that he owned and worked hard for. And it just says that his family and friends have raised $20,000 as a reward for anyone who um, gives information leading to his whereabouts. I don't know if it's been 10 years now. Today's November the 10th, so it's been 10 years, and um, there's never been a trace of him. And I, I don't know where the investigation stands. I'm, I'm assuming that it's considered still an open investigation, but I don't know if they're actually putting forth any work or if it's just kind of an idle cold case at this point. Hopefully if it does become considered a cold case, cold case detectives and, and cold case investigators, sometimes even college students at the local universities working in criminal justice will pick up these cases and work on them. And maybe someone will pick up his case and open it back up and start investigating the side of the story that I think is kind of glossed over here and not really talked about as much. But did they investigate his closest next of kin, who would be his wife? Did they look into her financial background? Was she having any kind of financial troubles? Did they have debts? There's a lot of angles to consider, and I wonder if they did. It's usually almost always the first thing in a missing person case or a murder is that they look at the spouse first. A couple of things that I read about and noted here are that... Um, was that when the search dogs came out and they brought bloodhounds out to search the woods for Eric Smith on a couple of different occasions the dogs would not go toward the woods they would pick up his scent and they would turn back and go back toward the house this tells me that he probably never was out in the woods at least not that morning not within a, a, an amount of time that the dogs would have picked up his scent I believe that whatever happened to him took place in that house, and I don't understand why uh, they didn't issue a search warrant to search the house and the area surrounding the house. Did they search his truck? I know they said they found his wallet inside of his truck, but his cell phone and his cigarettes were still at his house. Did they search the house? Did they check for missing items such as sheets and pillowcases from the bed? Um, I wonder also if any of his family members have given their DNA in put in into any of the genealogy or Jed match or anything like that in the event that sometime in the future remains could be found and you know this would lead whoever may find the remains it would tell who he was I don't know the answers to that I don't know if the police put the work into to that because what I read was that family members had asked for law outside law enforcement, maybe Virginia State Police and others to get involved in this in this search um, investigation. It, they did say that it was now being investigated as a homicide, but they didn't name a um, person of interest. If they did, I couldn't find any article about it. Because of this, Helton says that he has suffered um, recurring nightmares. 
he plays these memories over and over in his head, wondering if there was something going on that he overlooked. I think back to the last time that I spoke to Eric. We shared a ride from the airport near Bristol to Claypool Hill after we returned from a week-long class in Atlanta, Georgia. Our small talk was nothing much, just two coal miners talking about coal mining and our families and the weather. We talked about how warm it was in Atlanta and coming back to Virginia to the cold. I was never one to get too personal with co-workers, even though I admired Eric and enjoyed our conversation. Eric was dedicated to his family. He was an intelligent coal miner, an excellent supervisor. I respected him as a person and as a co-worker. But that wasn't shared on our ride to Claypool Hill. Who could know when I dropped him off into the loving arms of his wife and daughter that that would be the last time that I would ever see him? Eric Smith left his Cedar Bluff, Virginia home at around 10 a.m. on Friday morning, November the 8th, 2013. He planned to spend the morning hunting on his own property and told his wife that he would see her later that day. He had a deer stand located approximately one mile from his home. Shortly after Eric left, his wife and one of their daughters traveled to Buchanan County to spend the day there with um, her mother. They returned to the home later that evening to find that he had not come back home. He hadn't been feeling very well in the last few days, and he felt like he was maybe getting the flu. His wife was concerned when he wasn't home as the sun began to set. He told her that he wouldn't be gone long, so she started to get worried about him. He had not taken his cell phone with him when he left the house that morning. As darkness fell, Eric's wife grew more concerned. She knew that Eric's mother was attending Friday night church services nearby, so she drove to the church to ask if she had spoken to him. As soon as she saw her daughter-in-law come into the door of the church, she immediately knew that something was wrong. Everyone, and um, she and family members, immediately left the church and drove straight to Eric's house. People from the church also went along. Everyone was going out into the woods to search for Eric. Temperatures had been mild that day, but as the darkness fell, the temperature began to drop. Authorities immediately launched a search for Eric. Police officers, firefighters, and local volunteers searched the property. But as Friday night fell and it got darker, no trace of him was found. Eric had been wearing the standard camouflage hunting gear. Smith is described as a male, white male, six foot tall and 210 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. If anyone has any information, please contact the Virginia State Police at 276 228 3131. Christmas was a sad and difficult time for the Smith family as they continued to worry about their loved one. His absence during the holidays only made things more concerning as he would not have missed out on celebrating Christmas with his family. Some people had suggested that he was targeted by somebody that he worked with Maybe that he had given somebody a bad write-up. You know, um, as the mine foreman, it would have been his job. Others have suggested that he might have been targeted because um, somebody wanted his job. <laughs> you know, he goes from every little bit of, of uh, speculation and conspiracy. And, of course, there's always the angle of the marriage. Was his wife having an affair? Was she out for a... You know, did he have a large life insurance policy? It says here that Smith carried a muzzle loader with one shot likely already loaded. So police brought in dogs that could detect 
that muzzle, it's like a gunpowder instead of just like uh, cadaver dogs or dogs that maybe would just search for a person. They brought in dogs that would be able to kind of sniff out that smell of that gunpowder to see if his gun had been fired in, a, in any certain area. Um, sort, sort of like explosives. Because the muzzle loader, for those who don't know, uses like black powder. A lot of people call them black powder rifles, but it just says here that the some of the men in the area that hunt that area say it's very rough terrain, and it would have been very difficult to um, search, and that there may have been areas that they didn't go back into. I don't live very, very far from this area, and the area that I do live in, the terrain is much like that area in Virginia, and people, I, very much, I doubt very much that he would have ventured off into these deep, dark, rocky, rough areas unless he became disoriented or something. If he was one mile from his home... And he had a tree stand. More than likely, he would have gone and sat in his tree stand. And he may have got out and walked around for a while. If he saw a deer, he might have tracked it for a while. But scent dogs would have been able to pick up his scent. And he probably wouldn't have gone very far anyway. I don't think that this man would have tracked a deer for, you know very, very, very deep into the hills. Some people suggest that maybe he was accidentally shot by another, another hunter and it was covered up. Uh, someone here made a comment. Years ago, when I was married to my first husband, he fell backwards out of his tree stand and the gun went off and barely missed him. He suffered some broken bones, but luckily he had uh, someone else with him who was able to help him get out of the ho out of the hills and got him to a hospital. So they're suggesting that maybe this man might have fallen, he might have fell and injured himself. He could have shot himself, but he was never found. His gun was never found. Um... There are black bars in the area, but I doubt very much that a black bar would have eaten the man alive, of, you know, entirely, including his clothing and his gun. So, this guy says, I'm a hunter, and when I go hunting, I like to be in the woods just after sunup. Why was he going out to hunt at 10 a.m.? But, like I said earlier, it's possible that he never went into the woods. It's possible that he may have been killed in his home. The body could have been hidden. Now, I haven't seen anything on any of this to suggest that his wife was a, a suspect. I've been reading through here to see if there's anything on here that says what happened with his wife later on. Did she remarry? Did she, was it ever talked about that maybe she possibly was having financial problems? Did she collect a large life insurance policy on him? His mother believes that this was no hunting accident. She believes that someone knows of his whereabouts. She hopes that someone will contact the authorities with the information. This person says the Cedar Bluff Sheriff is a man that I've always been have thought highly of. He was my son's baseball coach, but he does not have a lot of law enforcement experience. I do not believe that he did a very good job of investigating this. Eric's family has begged for other agencies to become involved, and they have never come through. This person says, I don't want to point fingers, but I find it odd that his mother is the only family member that spoke out publicly. 
His wife never spoke out. His wife never said, please help us find him. This person here says, even in 2013, most people did not leave home without their cell phones. He would have taken his cell phone, especially if he was not feeling well. He might have turned the ringer off, but he still would have had it in case he needed to call out. My suspicions are focused within his home. I think that someone killed him. And I think we all kind of have an idea of who that would have been. The spouse is almost always the first person looked at. Did the police talk to his spouse in such a manner as to ask that question? Was his home searched for evidence of blood and any other type of evidence? These are good questions, and I'm going to continue to look into this. I'll just say that what I was searching for was the police investigation, and there really didn't seem to be one. I hope that someday, and this case may not be even considered a code case. I couldn't even find that. I hope that they do open this case back up and that somebody is out there um, investigating this. I don't know if the same police officers are in office that were in office when this happened 10 years ago. If uh, anybody, the, it said in one of the articles that I read that the family had asked for outside police to come in and help investigate this, but they never did. I'm looking on Facebook. There is a Facebook page dedicated to him. There hasn't been anything updated on it since 2021 when someone was wishing him a happy birthday. This man's name is Eric Grady Smith. He was 41 years old when he went missing from Cedar Bluff, Virginia on November the 8th, 2013. Eric is six foot one and weighs around 200 to 210 pounds. He has brown hair and hazel eyes. He was last seen, he was last known to have been wearing hunting gear, camouflage, a camouflage ball cap, and a camouflage jacket. And if you have any information on him, you can contact the Cedar Bluff Police Department at 276-964-4889. You may also contact Virginia State Police, and there is a tip line here is 1-866-660-4025. So this is kind of where the story leads off. It just kind of comes to a dead end. There, no trace of him was ever found. No arrests were ever made. No person of interest was ever really named. Despite the fact that the police said this was a homi that they were investigating this as a homicide, if anything new comes about, I will do an update on this story, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.